My name is Matt Reard, and I'm the the Oxford Outlaw. As a concerned citizen about the mail-in bouts, I need all of y'all to share this. I made reference earlier today to a a scandal going on, and it's deeply concerning. It should, I mean, it, it should horrify you. Um, being that we are right here around the corner of elections on a year where um, there's a pandemic that broke out that quite frankly I say was a was a complete overreaction and I think it was something that was introduced right here on election year and you see the big thing now is is the mail-in ballots and the mail-in ballots are sent out by circuit court, okay? The circuit clerk's job is to validate, is to make sure, verify the accuracy of the, of the mail-in ballots. This was August the 4th, 2020. You can see right here, um, this is on Delta Computer Systems. Matthew Reardon versus State of Mississippi. It's for post-conviction relief. All right. Judge name. Kent Smith. Mm -mm -mm. Three-year post-conviction relief. I'm going to show this up close right here. August 4th. Okay. Judge's name, Kent Smith. I want you to watch what happens right here. Because this is where, as a concerned citizen about the mail-in bouts. So, 8-4 there. Let's jump over to August 12th. I'm glad I had these screenshots. Okay? Because had I not have taken these screenshots, it would have been my word versus theirs. Okay? Delta Computer Systems, the beautiful part about it, and this is the reason why every city needs a Delta computer systems, every county, every state. I don't know if they do or don't. I know with Delta, they cover just about all the Mississippi counties. So you got August 12th, 2020. Judge Kent Smith is still the judge listed on here. That was also before I filed the post-conviction or the... Um, uh, the recusal. I filed a motion for recusal after Judge Kelly Luther denied my post-conviction relief. So right after I file the motion for recusal, this is before, okay, on August 12th. After I file the motion for recusal, judge's name changes to John Kelly Luther. You can also see that 812 motion for recusal with exhibits. They just entered that, and when they entered that, they changed the judge's name in the system that I was raising held 10 ways to Sunday about because there was a complete conflict of interest there was a judge that was made aware of all the fraud going on in this area outside of the courtroom. And my full expectation on the matter, I automatically assumed, okay, either Judge Luther, I doubted Judge Luther was going to be the judge. In fact, when I saw Kent Smith listed as the assigned judge, I didn't think twice about it. As you can see, a couple of things happened here. A, Judge Kelly Luther, John Kelly Luther, summarily and prejudicially made the call denying my post-conviction relief motion that was well-crafted and listed main, it, it listed very, you know, meritorious points in it that needed to be examined. And Judge John Kelly Luther takes it on himself to go in and to rule on another judge's case. Then on the motion to recuse himself, uh, 
the motion to recuse. I filed a, I turned around and filed a motion for Rule 59. Here, uh, a, a motion for rehearing under Mississippi Rule 59. After Luther had denied my first motion. I then two days later filed the motion for recusal. And up until that point, it was still Kent Smith in the system. Why are they changing records in Delta computer systems to suit their needs? If they would do it right here, okay? If they're doing it right here, how easy would it be for a ballot to be, to be changed? I mean, think about it. Circuit court, the circuit clerk is the one that sends out the ballots. The same court is controversially changing things in the system, not allowing me so much as a trial on the evidence. Now it gets it gets even uh, it gets even better. Okay, so we have the we have the email the judge that was made aware of everything in advance refuses to get out of the way. We got the he's the Judge Sullivan of Mississippi. Clearly, those that don't know what I'm talking about, General Michael Flynn. You've heard about him in the news. He was legally wiretapped by the FBI. It was all part of a plan to infiltrate the Trump campaign, basically baiting him into a lie. They coerced him under stress and fear of his own son. They said that if he didn't plea out to this crime of lying to the FBI, they were going to come after his son. Proof comes out of that. Department of Justice catches wind of it. They order for the plea to be tossed. And only problem is this judge, Judge Sullivan, refuses to step down. So, I want to show this up close right here. August 4th, okay? Judge's name, Kent Smith. I want you to watch what happens right here, okay? Because this is where, as a concerned citizen about the mail-in ballots. So here's the motion for rehearing under Mississippi Rule 59 that I typed up before the Honorable Judge Kent Smith. So I filed this motion right here before the Honorable Judge Kent Smith. He was the one that was listed on the file in Delta Computer Systems. I basically reiterated the stuff that was on the initial, the original post-conviction relief. But I took it just a tad bit farther than that. Petitioner alleges that his post-conviction relief motion was prejudicially denied with biasness and favorability shown to the respondent as the grounds on which post-conviction relief was brought along with the alleged fraud conducted by the state and Lafayette County not only warrant, but should in fact be interpreted as prejudicial against the, the petitioner for refusing to hold an evidentiary hearing on the facts both of the state's willful refusal and obstructionist tactics in refusing to comply with a FOIA Public Information Act request for the key evidence the state used to compel its warrant and charge. But Judge Kelly Luther was made aware of these facts before the PCR was filed and there's a conflict of interest in said case calling for a response and a recusal. The court being fully advised in the premises and having considered the arguments in petitioner's motion for rehearing finds that the motion is not well taken and is hereby denied. The clerk of the court is directed to provide a copy of the order to the petitioner, so ordered and adjudged on the 12th day of August. And here's the craziest part of all. Judge Luther orders this on the 12th, same day that I filed a motion for recusal by itself at circuit court, ironically. It wasn't put into Delta Computer Systems until September 11th. Right here. File this the 11th day of September 2020. Now, I'm not going to 
preemptively freak out on this matter because see, I, I really don't know what happened here. You have 30 days to put in a notice to appeal to the Supreme Court from the date the ruling was entered. 30 days. So the judge, the same day that I put in for the motion or recusal, the judge supposedly orders and the judges the denial. Gives it to the circuit clerk to get to me, to send to me. It wasn't entered into the computer system, and I was checking it every day to see if there was an update. It wasn't entered into the system until the 11th day of September. Now twice, I have been denied by Judge Kelly Luther. Now, I've been doing a live rolling documentary now since I say I started on it back in April or May called Riding with the Outlaw. And three years ago, back in May of 2017, I was wrongfully charged with a crime that I did not commit. Um, there was no way that I could have committed it. Even worse was the agencies involved. The Sheriff's Department knew that I couldn't have done it. The FBI knew that I couldn't have done it. The U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District of Mississippi knew that I couldn't have done it. I put my trust and faith in a assistant U.S. attorney over here at the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District. His name is Bob Norman. I call him Blowhard Bob. Blowhard Bob showed me that he was not a guy that could be trusted. put my faith in him. He told me to... Um, I had a death threat that was made on me. He suggested that I meet with the FBI. So I was arrested earlier that month in May 2017, standing in front of the Confederate statue, holding the state flag of Mississippi, with a gun on my hip. As I'm legally, constitutionally, legislatively allowed to do. And it was a it was a bad arrest that was made. At the end of the month of May, May 26th, I was ambushed on the square by four sheriff's deputies, arrested, not told what I was being arrested for until they got me to the jail. There, I found, I found out the charge was aggravated stalking. On or before May 8th, I put the lynches in fear of their life with an AR-15. Didn't purchase the gun, the AR-15, until May 20th. And have a bill of sale that backs that up. Now, I've been fighting this corrupt system, especially since starting on riding with the outlaw. The proverbial last straw in this thing was when my six-year-old child was once again used as a tool to manipulate me, to twist my wrist, was intentionally held away from me. See, the mayor's husband, Ray, I filed a motion for recusal after Judge Kelly Luther denied my post-conviction relief. So right after I file the motion for recusal, this is before, okay? On August 12th, after I file the motion for recusal, judge's name changes to John Kelly Luther. As I started getting to work on producing my live documentary, Riding with the Outlaw, I discovered more and more fraudulent activity being conducted by Lafayette County, by the authorities, by the agencies. They were covering their tracks on this. I did multiple FOIA Freedom of Information Act requests 
trying to compel information, trying to get the information that I needed beyond what I had so that I could just cross all or cross all T's, dot all I's. And um, the FBI. So I did a FOIA request for the public rec or for the 302 investigative re report of the FBI back on May 25th, 2017. The reason I wanted that was because I wanted to show that everything I had been saying up to that point and everything that I was saying in regards to my case was 100% the truth. I met with them about this reason. This is the stuff that I discussed. After all, Michael Flynn, General Flynn, charged with lying to the FBI. Okay? It's a federal crime to lie to the FBI. So you would think, automatically, in order for me to truly be guilty of what the state was charging me with, that would have meant that I was guilty also of lying to the FBI because you can't have it both ways. I couldn't have, you know, told the FBI that I purchased a gun on May 20th. You know, that would have been a big part of the meeting because I had a death threat on me. But the state of Mississippi alleges that on or before May 8th, I took that same weapon and put, them, and put the lynches in fear of their life. By the way, just about every day, leading up until May 19th, I was visiting the lynches bar. It was right across the street from an attorney friend of mine on the square in Oxford. I don't know anybody that would, in their right mind, put somebody in fear of their life and continue visiting their establishment doesn't make a whole lot of sense okay so long story short I reach out to judge Luther's office to his assistant named Kathy Kathy tells me to send her an email with all the information about the, the, the fraud about my innocence um, in the matter and that she would get it to judge Luther and would get back to me as to what to do See, I was looking for an evidentiary hearing so that I could present this information I sent it to her, I get a response back. I filed my own post-conviction relief motion after reaching out to Judge Luther, his office, I spoke to his assistant, okay? I said, Kathy, I'm looking for a directive from Judge Luther on my case LK17-295. In my efforts to gather all evidence to back the fact that I had inadequate legal representation in my case, which actually included a common interest to the other side, by my attorney, I have uncovered numerous erroneous corrupt acts committed on behalf of the state. My first, eighth, and fourteenth amendment rights were trampled on, and everything was an organized act to prevent me from coming forward with information I had which would have had political implications on the then incoming mayor Robin Tannehill. I hold in my possession circumstantial evidence proving beyond any shadow's doubt my innocence to the matter. I have requested the 302 from the sit-down meeting with the FBI on May 25th, 2017, the day before my arrest by Lafayette County, in which I had a death threat on my life and it explained in that meeting that I had purchased the AR-15 on May 20th as a way to protect myself and my family. The erroneous frame charge on me stated on or before May 8th. I put the lynches in fear of their life with that weapon, but it's simply impossible, and a bill of sale proves that. This was a brutal assassination of my rights in order to keep information from coming out that could potentially have political ramifications on the mayor, along with achieving the goal, yada, yada, yada. You can see this email. It's on the court filings at Lafayette County Circuit Court, unless those get tampered with as well. I get an email back from Kathy. Received. Thank you, Mr. Reardon. This was on June the 1st, 2020 at 8.49 p.m. Thank you, Miss Kathy. When do you think you have an answer from Judge Luther? My concern at the present moment is two things in particular, one being the three-year statute of limitations and the other being destruction of evidence. I have reason to believe through correspondence with the FBI 
at the 302 from the interview with, with the FBI conducted on May 25, 2017, where I produced evidence of the death threat made on me, as well as information I had at the time on Ray Tannehill was discussed. Is missing in action, along with the video evidence of the meeting. Now, based on the Sheriff's Department not complying through refusing to communicate back on my request for the, rec for the recorded phone call, supposedly from May 24, 2017, it leads me to believe that either there's either damning information that further substantiates my claim and or could be missing in action as well, which leads me to feeling the need to draft a complaint in the Northern District in order to pre uh, prevent any evidence in question or any other evidence from disappearing. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind, which is backed by evidence, that this was a cooked charge that I was framed on and has had serious life-altering implications on my life. One thing I'm trying to get to the bottom of here is the question of was it done at the directive of public officials and even worse, for political purposes, as all signs point to. The precedence this sets, if allowed to stand, is lethal to society and completely destructive to our constitution that's been framed in place for hundreds of years. So I guess the huge question at hand is this. Uh, will Judge Luther grant me an emergency hearing within the next week, if possible, in order for me to present evidence to the facts stated, in order to, at the minimum, quash the covenant to not sue, with the ultimate goal of getting the plea and sentence vacated, okay? So I sent that right back to Kathy that night. I then get a response back on Tuesday, the 2nd of June. Mr. Reardon, Judge Luther has reviewed your emails and asked me to re respond to you to let you know that in Mississippi, when someone wishes to challenge a plea of guilty, the rules need to be followed as outlined in the Mississippi Code for post-conviction relief. Okay? Um, if you wish to have the issues heard in court, please follow the rules as set forth in the Post-Conviction Relief Act. Thank you for your attention, and perhaps you'll find this helpful. Okay, so I file a post-conviction relief where this thing takes a sharp left-hand turn off the road and a left the city is when the judge assigned to the case and the judge that summarily and prejudicially denied my motion for post-conviction relief in fact so right here Here are the five, I've got several, meritorious facts that I raise, concerns that I raise in this post-conviction relief, which are definitely worthy, at the very minimum, worthy of having an evidentiary hearing. And I would say that there's probably judges out there that would probably go ahead and toss my plea based on the reasons listed in this post-conviction relief. That the petitioner pled guilty to the aforementioned alleged crime and was sentenced by circuit court of Lafayette County, Mississippi on the 6th of July, 2017 in cause number LK17-295 to five years in the custody of the Department of Corrections with the balance of the sentence to be served out on supervised probation, a true copy of which is attached here to as, as Exhibit B. It's filed pursuant to uh, Mississippi Code 9939-5. It's the Post-Conviction Relief Collateral Act filed in the correct jurisdiction and venue. That the respondent, which is the state of Mississippi, the county, was in direct violation of the petitioner's first, eighth, and fourteenth constitutional rights at the time the plea was given. Big one right there. I honestly, I believe that if any, constitutional rights are violated, I believe that it's worthy of a hearing. I believe that, that our civil rights, our constitutional rights are that important. And they've come that much under attack in today's society that any allegations of constitutional rights violations by the state is worthy of, of taking a look at, for sure. So, next point. The petitioner's guilty plea was involuntary due to a denial of his due process rights as guaranteed by the United States and state of Mississippi constitutions, thus making his plea guilty a violation of the laws of the state of Mississippi. The petitioner received inadequate representation by his legal counsel on record 
in which adequate council representation likely would have resulted in an outright dismissal of the state's frivolous charge. Furthermore, petitioner only met with his legal counsel one time and no discovery motion was ever requested by the petitioner's legal counsel. Next point, that the state has refused to comply with a Freedom of Information Act request for information regarding the phone call received on May 24, 2017, in which the, uh, through the state's own admission on a more recent public records request, ultimately led to the charge being levied against the petitioner. A copy of the state's admission to the phone call and basing their allegation on it is attached here to as exhibit C. C. If there exists additional evidence of material facts not reasonably discovered at the time of involuntary plea, not previously presented and heard, which requires vacation of the conviction or sentence in the interest of justice. All right, and that would be, of course, the evidence, the bill of sale, the um, you know, everything that I had discovered so far up to that point with writing with the outlaw. I've discovered just, it's a ridiculous amount of evidence. Ridiculous. I've been trying to upload the evidence, keep the evidence on my website, writingwiththeoutlaw.com. And if you have not gone there, I highly suggest that you go there and check that out. All right, I just gave it a facelift here recently. It looks a lot better. And it's going to continually look better and better as more and more information is uploaded to it. So, I then so I get a order posted in Delta Computer Systems. It's posted on the 30th of July, so that was approximately two weeks, two and a half weeks after I filed the post-conviction relief. Now there's several things that stood out in this that were very odd after reviewing the documents filed by the petitioner the court finds it plainly appears from the face of the motion in prior proceedings that the petitioner is not entitled to any relief the court finds the transcript of the plea and sentencing hearing in the petitioner's criminal case um, for aggravated stalking belies petitioner's claims for relief therefore the court is of the opinion requested relief is not well taken and is hereby denied. Now, I'm going to go ahead and make it known that at that point, transcript was not published to the file of LK17295 because what happened after that is what is so shockingly bizarre. Okay? John Kelly Luther should have never been on this case to begin with. This was 8-4. Okay? So this was... August the 4th, 2020, you can see right here, um, this is on Delta Computer Systems. Matthew Reardon versus State of Mississippi. It's for post-conviction relief, all right? Judge name, Kent Smith. Mm -mm -mm. Three-year post-conviction relief. You can see right here. It's got the uh, order denying relief. At the end of the day, as I've said throughout the whole entire Riding with the Outlaw live documentary series, this was nothing but a witch hunt. This was a quid pro quo scandal. This benefited multiple parties, including the Lafayette County Sheriff's Department. Deputy Sheriff Timmy Pruitt. It also benefited the county, all right, because the county, the sheriff's department, and Timmy Pruitt were coming under fire from the May 1st arrest that was going viral on Cop Block. I'm going to show this up close right here. August 4th, okay? Judge's name, Kent Smith. I want you to watch what happens right here, okay? Let's jump over to August 12th, 2020. Judge Kent Smith is still the judge listed on here. 
after I file the motion for recusal, judge's name changes to John Kelly Luther. You can also see that 812 motion for recusal with exhibits. They just entered that. And when they entered that, they changed the judge's name in the system that I was raising hell 10 ways to Sunday about because there was a complete conflict of interest. Why are they changing records in Delta computer systems to suit their needs? As you can see, a couple of things happened here. A, Judge Kelly Luther, John Kelly Luther, summarily and prejudicially made the call denying my post-conviction relief motion that was well crafted and listed main it, it listed very you know meritorious points in it that needed to be examined and judge john kelly luther takes it on himself to go in and to rule on another judge's case and then get this matters before the court on petitioner's motion titled motion for rehearing under Mississippi Rule 59 before the Honorable Judge Kent Smith. The petitioner requests this court reconsider its order entered July 30th, 2020 in which the court under Mississippi Code annotated section 9939-11 summarily denied petitioner's request for post-conviction collateral relief. The petitioner also alleges the undersigned judge should recuse himself from this post-conviction matter. The court, being fully advised in the premises and having considered the arguments in petitioner's motion for rehearing, finds that the motion is not well taken and is hereby denied. The clerk of the court is directed to provide a copy of the order to the petitioner, so ordered and adjudged on the 12th day of August. That was when he signed it. Okay. And here's the craziest part of all. Right here. File this the 11th day of September, 2020. So I really don't know what happened here. You have 30 days to put in a notice to appeal to the Supreme Court from the date the ruling was entered. 30 days. So the judge the same day that I put in for the motion or recusal, the judge supposedly orders and the judges the denial. Gives it to the circuit clerk to get to me, to send to me. It wasn't entered into the system until the 11th day of September. 30 days later. Now twice, I've been denied by Judge Kelly Luther. The circuit clerk's office is there defending him. I mean, well after this whole process had started and was going, changed the judge and the system assigned to my case that I had gone under the impression was my judge and changes to a judge that should be recused. They would do that in light of all the obstruction, all the fraudulent concealment, all the criminal activity. Now, they're picking the gun up and turning it around on the citizens. Turning the gun around on a veteran, Marine Corps veteran. And if they can do that to someone who pledged a lifelong oath to their country, the government, you better bet your ass that they can do it to you and they will do it to you in a heartbeat. I am, in fact, appealing to the Supreme Court. I would love to appeal to the Supreme Court right this second to throw John Kelly Luther 
off of my case. In fact, at this point, I think he probably needs to be recused of all cases at Lafayette County Circuit Court. Because clearly he's not in his right mind to make the rulings that he's making. The state has destroyed me over this. I've lost three houses since everything happened three years ago. Having the attached stigma that comes with being a stalker alleged by the state when I never did anything of the such. And the state knows it. These federal agencies know it. I never knew that I would find everything that I found. I didn't expect it. I knew I was going to publish my findings, but I never knew that I would find anything remotely close to what I found. And it continually getting deeper, the web, the spider web, continuing to go deeper and deeper. Well, thank you for tuning in. I'm trying to get a little better and better each time with my video software. I don't know if you've seen the transition over the past few months, but I've been trying to put more into it, trying to get my lighting right. And I got the virtual camera going now. A few little hiccups there, here and there. So I think what I want to advise everybody the most of is get out to the polls and vote, okay? I think that we're going to have the amount of fraud that we're going to see in this in this coming election. It's going to it's going to completely rip our country apart. I have no doubt about it. I, the way that that it's already tearing itself apart right now. Don't leave it to mail in voting, mail in ballots. Don't give them any more ballots to count. Don't they need? Them. Just go to the go to the voting booth. Go to the voting booth. You vote that way, because I you know I wouldn't trust my ballot in the hands of somebody else. Please follow my page. My name is Matt Reardon. I am the Oxford Outlaw. Thanks to Lafayette County, state of Mississippi, that ultimately took that name and ran, banished me, city of Oxford and Lafayette County, for the term of my probation. They thought it was five years to the corrupt state actors. Got my eyes on you. So I want to read something, and this is going to be, I think, probably the final little bit that I was going to touch on, and that is how ironically spot on this is. This is 42 U.S. Code 1985, Conspiracy to interfere with civil rights, federal. First paragraph really doesn't apply. It's preventing an officer from performing duties, but the second and the third are spot on. Second, obstructing justice, intimidating party, witness, or juror. If two or more persons in any state or territory conspired to deter, by force, intimidation, or threat, any party or witness in any court of the United States from attending such court or from testifying to any matter pending therein, freely, fully, and truthfully, or to injure such party or witness, person or property on account of his having so attended or testify, or to influence the verdict, presentment, or indictment of any grand or petite juror in any such court, or to injure such juror in his person or property on account of any verdict, presentment, or indictment lawfully assented to by him, or of his being or having been such juror, or if two or more persons conspire for the purpose of impeding, hindering, obstructing, or defeating in any manner the due course of justice 
in any state or territory with intent to deny to any citizen the equal protection of the laws or to injure him or his property for lawfully enforcing or attempting to enforce the right of any person or class of persons to the equal protection of the laws. <clears throat> That's spot on right there, that last sentence. Because I don't think you can get any closer than this. When the agencies that are supposed to prevent this type of stuff from happening, when they're not doing their job in intervening and preventing it, when they play a part in it themselves. And when we as citizens do what we as citizens are entitled to do, to step up and hold these people accountable. That blocking me, trying to rig charges, trying to conspire, which is just two or more people planning. And then section three is depriving persons of rights or privileges. If two or more persons in any state or territory conspire to go in disguise on the highway or on the premises of another, for the purpose of depriving, either directly or indirectly, any person or class of persons of the equal protection of the laws, or of equal privileges and immunities under the laws, or for the purpose of preventing or hindering the constituted authorities of any state or territory from giving or securing to all persons within such state or territory the equal protection of the laws or if two or more persons conspire to prevent by force, int intimidation, or threat any citizen who is lawfully entitled to vote from giving his support or advocacy in a legal matter toward or in favor of the election of any lawfully qualified person as an elector for president or vice president or as a member of Congress of the United States or to injure any citizen in person or property on account of such support or advocacy in any case of conspiracy set forth in this section if one or more persons engaged therein do or cause to be done any act in furtherance of the object of such conspiracy whereby another is injured in his person or property or deprived of having or exercising any right or privilege of a citizen of the United States, the party so injured or deprived may have action for the recovery of damages occasioned by such injury or deprivation against any one or more of the conspirators. I think two and three, I think they were written about riding with the outlaw. Because there's no way they can defend against that. No way. Because the facts, without even making any blind assertions, just the facts alone, read what those two paragraphs read.
Okay, I wanted to um, read off the petition I'm filing at Chancery Court tomorrow. I wanted to get it filed today, ran out of time, and the details would not stop flowing. This problem needs to be nipped in the bud. So in the Chancery Court of Lafayette County, Mississippi, Matthew Oliver Reardon verse Phyllis Marie Crowder Kester, emergency petition for citation of contempt and modification of child custody and child support agreement and other relief. Comes now the petitioner, Matthew Oliver Reardon, and files this his emergency complaint of contempt and petition for modification of custody against the defendant, Phyllis Crowder Kester. In support thereof, your petitioner would respectfully show unto the court the following. This court has personal and subject matter jurisdiction in the matter. Two, that the defendant, Phyllis Crowder, Kester, is an adult resident citizen of Lafayette County, may be served with process at her residence in Lafayette County, Mississippi, or wherever she may be found. That on August, this court entered an agreed order of modification regarding child visitation, a true and correct copy of which is attached here to is Exhibit A. That the defendant abruptly cease communication between the plaintiff and his child for approximately two weeks beginning on Christmas Day of 2019 when plaintiff's third child was born at the Tupelo Women's Hospital, breaching the agreement established by this court through intentionally preventing communication between the plaintiff and his minor child. It is of the plaintiff's impression that the defendant's jealousy of a new sibling being born was the willful cause of this contumacious action due to the defendant demonstrating the same harmful choices and malicious behavior in May of 2018 after the plaintiff's second child was born on April 30th. The plaintiff would further show that the conduct of the defendant as well as the defendant's attorney, attorneys have far surpassed self-assuming the role of judge, jury, and executioner, and that the malicious, frivolous, and false claims that have been asserted by the defendant and her attorney have met and exceeded the threshold required for slander, defamation of character, abuse of process, and malicious prosecution. The plaintiff would demonstrate to this court that by admission on a recorded phone call on this date, the defendant admitted to conspiring with her present husband in an obnoxious attempt to falsely accuse the plaintiff of raping her on November 28, 2018. As a result of her criminal actions, Olive Branch Police Department filed a misdemeanor charge and sought a warrant for her arrest in or around January of 2019 for making a false police report. As such, it's the intention of the petitioner to bring separate tort causes of action, seeking remedies to the damages inflicted in the appropriate courts for relief from such actions. Evidence of defendant admitting to such conspiracy with her husband is attached here to his Exhibit B. As if this wasn't ob uh, obnoxious enough, and all the legal showboating by the defendant and her attorneys at the intentional compromise of a loving and caring father whom has demonstrated the highest echelon of civility and restraint with defendant despite the sacred bond between father and daughter severed over and over again at the hands of one that clearly demonstrated a lack of moral turpitude, empathy, and a complete disregard for others, including the minor child. The proverbial last straw came August 26, 2020 when the defendant filed yet again another petition to modify the custody order entered by this court. Said filing not only was a frivolous filing, but one that made no sense whatsoever. The plaintiff would show into this court that through multiple recorded phone calls with Department of Child Services, the plaintiff was advised that complaint, as well as all complaints for that matter, were dismissed as unfounded. And the defendant was and is well aware of that. To include Crowder's most recent attorney, Christy McCoy, who chose to further attack the character of the petition, a United States Marine Corps veteran and a completely vile attempt to defend against the charge levied by Olive Branch Police Department after her client, aberrant, reputable, and downright disgusting false allegation of rape placed on the father of her child. With the attached evidence, petitioner would move this honorable court for a trial at its earliest available time. Petitioner would also move this court to consider the bizarre occurrences that have occurred 
and to grant petitioner an emergency trial on the said facts and additional evidence the petitioner is prepared to present before this court. And the petitioner would assert that if the court is backed up and unable to grant an emergency hearing to grant the transfer possession of the minor child over to the petitioner, especially in light of the petitioner being denied rights to his child as set forth in the visitation agreement.